Can you imagine our service being interrupted today by the police coming in and arresting someone in our room? Imagine how much more traumatic it would be if it was one of the pastors. Well, um, I actually came close to being arrested one time. I know you're interested in the story, aren't you? First, I would like to use the disclaimer that it was back when I was in college. <laughs> the second thing I would say is, is that uh, there was a place out, it was called Lake LaSalle. I used to go and eat my lunch out there, and one day there was a guy in a pickup truck who told me I couldn't go there. So I waited for him to leave, and then I went there anyway and uh, had my lunch. And uh, uh, he came back, and he seemed angry, and so I just took off. I was in my car. And uh, I was driving down uh, one of the roads on the university, and I saw a security car coming towards me, and he looked at me like he was looking for me. And that concerned me. And so I pulled into the parking lot where my dormitory was, and I got out, and when I got out, I was immediately surrounded by about a half a dozen police cars, all of them with their guns drawn on me and telling me to put my hands on top of the car. Um, I did. <laughs> And you're probably not surprised that I found a way to talk myself out of that. I actually didn't think that the guy in the pickup truck was anything related to the university. It turns out he was. And uh, when he found out that I was not just trying to be disrespectful or destructive, uh, they dropped all charges and I was not charged. That wasn't the case for a guy by the name of the Apostle Paul. He actually was arrested in a temple during a time when people were gathered for worship. And uh, he was there going through the ritual for purification. There was a reason why he was going through this, and it's a little complicated to go into today. But while he was there, there was someone who recognized him, and they didn't like him, and so they began to say things very vocally and publicly about him, and they incited people in the crowd to anger and to action. And the soldiers who were nearby saw that a riot could break out, and so they ran to that location to try to quell this thing before it got out of hand. And the author of the book of Acts, who is Luke, includes an interesting phrase in Acts 21 about this. He says, the doors of the temple were closed. And it's easy to read that and just say, well, the reason that they did that was to stop this violence from breaking out even further than it was. But it's far more meaningful than that. All throughout the temple area, there were signs that were posted that certain kinds of people were not welcome and not permitted to be there. So when the doors of the temple were shut, what it's signifying is that the temple can no longer function as a place where people can access God's grace. They're closing the doors. Paul was put in chains. He was being escorted away from the temple, and he asked the guard, if he could have an opportunity to speak to the people. And this is what he said. It's recorded in Acts 22. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. Paul identifies his ethnic heritage. He identifies his birthplace. He identifies that Jerusalem had been a huge influence on his upbringing. He identifies his education. Gamaliel was considered the leading teacher and, and uh, academic instructor of his day. And he acknowledges that he also had a great zeal for God. He goes on to say, I persecuted the followers of this way to their death arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can themselves testify, I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. It's a fascinating thing, and what he's telling them is, is where my zeal took me. His, he took his zeal as far as it could go. He had people arrested. He had people in prison. There were even people put to death as a result of his actions. Paul takes his beliefs to their logical conclusion. He doesn't just harbor thoughts that don't go anywhere. He takes them to where they would go if you carried them out to their extreme. 
And he says, about noon, I came near Damascus. Suddenly, a bright light from heaven flashed around me. Paul discovered that there was actually a light that was brighter than anything he had been living by or under. He tells us that it's noon, which indicates that this is actually fascinating. At the very brightest point of the day, there was a light that flashed around him that was far more brilliant. And he says, I fell to the ground and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? In case you're wondering why I'm calling him Paul and Jesus calls him Saul, it's because back in the, before he became a Christian, his name was Saul. Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth. Whom you are persecuting, he replied. Paul is confronted with the truth that, that he is actually living in a way that is opposed to God, opposed to Christ. Now, it's easy to come up with this conclusion when you kind of create your own rules for life. Because it's easy to think, well, I'm just living my own way and that would be opposed to life. In fact, rule makers often don't pride themselves as being rule breakers. They just think that the rules other people make don't apply to them. And so they just kind of make their own rules for life. And have you ever noticed when people make their own rules for life, they tend to favor them? It's just how it works. Uh, Paul, however, was a very religious person, and he followed all the rules. Do we have any firstborns in the room today? Yeah. As a rule, firstborns are good rule keepers. We just learn to do that. There's a hypervigilance in our parents that they kind of wear down over time. You know? and, and so but that hypervigilance makes us good rule followers. And, and in fact, later in one of his letters, Paul would describe his ability to keep rules as, like this. He said, when it come to following the law, I was faultless. That's a pretty high standard. Yet his rule following was in much as opposition to God and to Christ as the people who make him break the rules. How is that possible? Because when you think you're really good at following the rules, the tendency is to think you are better than other people who are not good at following the rules. It's not an orientation towards grace. He considered other people as lesser people, like a disease that needed to be eradicated from the planet. When you're in the process of saving yourself by rule keeping, you will eventually see others as less and as dangerous. He went on to say, my companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. Those traveling with Paul didn't understand the words that were spoken to Paul. What's true is that often those that we live with and among and love the most often struggle to understand what God is communicating to us. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. In a way, this really isn't blindedness. The light didn't blind Paul as much as it revealed the blindness he already had. You see, he assumed he had perfect vision. He believed that his belief system was the way everyone should have to live. And what he was blind to, he was blind to the heart of God who actually cared for the people that he despised. He was blind to the power of God that could transform a life beyond his ability to believe that God could do. He was blind to his own weakness and his own sinfulness. In another letter, he would describe himself as the chief of all sinners. He was blind to the purpose that God had for his life. He thought his purpose was to get rid of weaker, lesser people. And what God's purpose for his life was, was to reach them so that God could redeem them. A man named Ananias came to, the, uh, uh, came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews that were living there. This is fascinating. Ananias loved God and the law, but he had also been exposed to grace. And when you love God and the law and you've been exposed to grace, it makes you a very different person. Now, he knew Paul was responsible for this campaign of terror against Christians. He knew exactly who he was, and he knew exactly what he had done. It would be the equivalent today of God coming to us and saying, I want you to go talk to someone who's a well-known terrorist in the world. How many would love to sign up for an, an assignment like that and just give me that one? Well, Ananias didn't want to do it either, but he did believe that God knew what he was doing. 
And even though he knew what Paul was up to, he didn't use it as an excuse to keep his distance from him. Ananias stood beside me and said, what's the next word? <laughs> brother. You really going to call that guy brother? Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Ananias call, calls Paul brother. And he stands beside him. In the previous account, we learned that he actually laid his hands on him. We cannot really expect others to see what we see if we keep our distance from them and our friendliness from them. This idea that people have to earn their way to get into rooms like this is fraught with disaster. Ananias goes to Paul, the terrorist. Ananias calls him brother. Ananias extends a hand to him. And the result is, is that Paul's eyes are then open. Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. See, Ananias revealed that God has a purpose for Paul's life, and it's not the eradication of lesser people, it's the redemption of all people. He revealed, first of all, that God had actually chosen him, which is a very different model than you earning your way onto the spot of a team. You know, if you look at how many is interested in the March Madness games. By the way, my alum is, is uh, University of Buffalo, who actually had a phenomenal upset match. I loved watching that game. And for the first time in history, a number 16 seed beat a number one seed. That's really fascinating. So here we have this incredible, well, what I will tell you is every one of those guys who are on that team earned their way on the team. They have to have certain skills and abilities and capacities. They've got to show up for certain practices, go through the drills, study, film, do everything that's required in order for them to make it on that team. And our world operates on that system. But Ananias tells Paul this. He said, it's not because you earned your way on this team. It's because God chose you to be on this team. And the second thing he reveals is that you're going to be a witness to all people. And now what are you waiting for? Get up. Be baptized. Wash your sins away, calling on his name. Ananias encourages Paul, don't procrastinate. Start your journey now. Be baptized in water. Call on the name of Jesus. When I returned to Jerusalem and I was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Jesus actually warns Paul that when he tries to communicate in this area, he's not going to be received. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. It's a fascinating remembrance that Paul is having. He remembers what he did to other people. He imprisoned and beat those who believed in Jesus. He was a co-conspirator in the death of Stephen. And then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Jesus tells Paul that he must go to the people that he once thought were outside of God's plans and purpose. The Gentiles were the excluded ones. They were the ones that the warning signs were made for. And they're the ones that Paul is being told, you go take those signs down and you open doors wide to the grace of God. The signs were not there to bring people to God. The signs were there to keep people from God. And, and God is telling Paul, I want you to go reach the people you've been trying to keep out. So why do I talk about this story? And why have I walked through these verses of Scripture? And I didn't include them in your notes like we usually do today because there were so many they wouldn't fit unless I made it really small, and then you wouldn't be able to see it. And that is because Paul is actually telling his story. What's fascinating is this story is told three times in the book of Acts alone, the first time as an historical account, and the next two times it's Paul telling his story to people so they can understand something about the grace of God and what God uh, has done to make a difference in his own life. So what I want you to know is that just like Paul has a story to tell, each and every one of us have a story to tell. 
but we often haven't thought about it very much. So if we're going to be able to share our story, there's a few things I think it would help us to be able to focus on. If you want to share your story, think about what you thought about God before you were introduced to grace. Before you bought into this idea that God is good and his grace is for you and, and his, he's got good plans and purposes for your life, before you ever believed into that, what did you used to think about God? How did you used to view him? Did you view him as an austere rule maker who likes to punish people who step out of bounds? Or maybe you were one of those people who wanted to be your own God just by making your own rules because you didn't want to submit to the rules of others and you would decide what a good person and a good life was going to be. Or maybe you surrender completely to the rule keepers. It's astonishing how many people are religious before they become a believer in Christ. They're kind of raised in religious systems. And in that scenario, maybe you just grew up believing you deserved the acceptance and the favor of God. What was, what was your life like before you were exposed to grace. Another thing that can be an important part of your story is what you thought when someone tried to share their faith with you. When they brought up spiritual things or they quoted something out of scripture or they told you something about the life of God's son, did it annoy you? That can be a great part of your story. You know, sometimes we don't want to admit that, but some of us were thoroughly annoyed by friends or family members who tried to talk about spiritual things to us. Or maybe you even thought that they were weak because they needed religion in order to be able to make it in life. Or maybe you actually admired them because they seemed to have found some faith and some purpose that had escaped you and you wished you could have it too. You have a story to tell. What did you think when other people tried to share their faith with you? And then how you came to realize that you had been blind to your need for God's grace. There came a moment when you realized life wasn't working for you. Maybe you'd gone through a painful experience in your life that disintegrated the illusion that you were in control or that you could figure all this stuff out. Or maybe there was a conversation where someone talked about spiritual ways in such attractive, uh, spiritual things in st such attractive ways that you were automatically interested. And maybe you were exposed to some ideas that generally and, and thoroughly uh, intrigued you. Or maybe you were good at life. Maybe you were good at getting all the stuff everybody strives at. And, and you got it, and it didn't do what it was supposed to do. You didn't feel significant. You didn't feel secure. Uh, it didn't provide what you thought it was going to provide. Uh, there was a way that grace came to you, and you came to realize you needed this very important part of your story. And then when telling your story, share how you responded to the grace of God. What did that look like in your own life? In your own words, how did you make that decision and what did you do as a result of it? For lots of people, they pray a prayer. Uh, I love to hear the, the, the prayer my father told over and over again that he prayed when he first connected with Christ. This was his prayer. He said, I don't even know if you're real, but just in case you are, and just in case that you are as good as I have heard, I would like to get to know you. And if you are that good, I'll spend the rest of my life working with you. That's a good prayer to start with. What kind of prayer did you pray? Lots of people pray that kind of prayer. Some people have done enough research and seen enough evidence that they're actually a little bit more convinced. And so what their decision is, is to stop depending on themselves for being good enough and start depending on the grace of God to make the difference. No matter how you get to that prayer, everyone comes to the same conclusion. I can't pay for my own sins, but God decided to. And this is the great challenge about grace. This is why grace so offends so many people. And that is grace insists that your sins are so bad, it took nothing less than the death of God's own son to pay the price for them. And there were lots of people who go, yeah, I'm not that bad. And usually when you get into those kinds of conversations, they'll start with this. I haven't killed anybody. Well, how many think the threshold for getting into heaven ought to be just a little bit higher than you didn't kill anybody? And by the way, there are people in heaven who did kill somebody. So what are we going to do about that? You see, we 
we get into this situation where we don't realize when we respond to the grace of God what a difference it's made in my life that the truth about every one of us is put us in the right circumstances under the right pressures and we are capable of doing the most horrific things. We're not special. We're not different. We're all capable of doing incredibly hurtful, harmful, destructive things. And just because we haven't had the opportunity doesn't mean that there's not a potential for that within us. And the grace of God comes to transform our hearts. Makes a huge difference. And then lastly, talk about the difference that grace is making in your life. Maybe for you, you were a rule keeper, and so keeping those rules, you're still doing that, only now you're doing them for better reasons. Maybe you're a little less judgmental of others. Maybe you're more likely to extend yourself towards someone so that you can see a difference made in their life. Maybe you've got a little more faith when you see others going through incredibly difficult things. Or maybe you have a sense that you're living out your purpose in life. What I can tell you is if you will take these components and just draft your own story, it's astonishing how often God will give you the opportunity to share it. And by the way, this is not a mini-series on television that takes weeks and weeks for you to tell. You should be able to tell your story at least as fast as the Apostle Paul did. We can tell it within minutes, but it's a story of his incredible transformation that he's working in our lives by his grace, because the grace of God is the most transformative thing in our world. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, I'm grateful for the intervention of your grace in each and every one of our lives. I'm grateful for the difference you are making in us, and while none of us claim to be perfect today, a lot of us can see the growth and the change that you are creating in us. I just ask that you would help us, even before this day is over, to sit down and think through these components and work through our own story because it will remind us of the difference you're making in our lives, but it will give us something to share. And I believe there will be moments when the question comes up when the door of opportunity opens. And it's not just an argument of you should believe what I believe because I think it's better. It is let me tell you what God's grace has done in my life. And maybe that will open your grace to their life as well. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.